everyone. I'm Peter McMillan, the Executive Officer at NT Shelter. We're broadcasting today from the land of the Larrakia people here in Darwin. And I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to any other First Nations people who may be watching this broadcast. Sharing the Couch is a new initiative at NT Shelter whereby we get to talk to people from across a range of uh, professions and locations that are working in the housing and homes of space or are doing work that's closely associated with that and trying to make a real difference to the lives of people who don't have access to stable housing. The name Sharing the Couch is inspired by the annual couch surfing races that young uh, people uh, get involved with every year up here in Darwin as part of Anglicare NT's Youth Homelessness Matters Day. It's also a reminder uh, of the work that still needs to be done to provide stable housing for our young people. Over the coming fortnights, we've got a number of people lined up, uh, which we're excited about. So stay tuned on our YouTube channel for future episodes as they come through. Hit the subscribe button and get notifications of when we release the next podcast. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our next guest on, for this episode, Dr. Simon Quilty. Dr. Simon Quilty has lived and worked in the remote Northern Territory, working as a specialist physician for the past decade, with over 20 years of experience in remote medicine in the NT. He has a background in public health and engineering and sees the health inequities facing remote First Nations people as fundamentally linked to colonisation and the subsequent inadequacies, inadequacies of housing and infrastructure that these people now live with. Simon is undertaking research, examining the relationship between environmental heat and well-being in the Northern Territory, taking a cultural lens to examine opportunities to adapt to future warming that is now underway in the tropical north of Australia. Dr. Quilty graduated from mechanical engineering at Sydney University in 1998. After working for a biotech start startup, he went on to study medicine, which he combined with a research master's in public health. He's worked as a doctor in the remote Northern Territory for most of the past 20 years. In 2012, he initiated the first specialist physician service at Catherine Hospital. Over the next eight years, he developed five new training positions within the hospital. He stabilized the acute and outpatient services, commenced a remote outreach service, a cardiology imaging service, and a satellite oncology unit in Catherine, allowing remote living people to allowing remote living people to access complex healthcare much closer to home. There were substantial and measurable improvements to hospital performance, including much improved culturally safe care. Dr. Quilty has also received a number of honours and awards from his time in the industry. 14, I counted uh, at last count, including the Top End Health Service Quality Award for Innovation for Catherine Hospital Remote Outreach Service, the Chief Minister's Award for Excellence in the Public Sector in the area of telehealth, the Northern Territory Clinical Educator of the Year Award, the Most Proficient Student in Public Health Award at the University of Sydney, and a number of other prizes associated with his thesis in engineering as the best undergraduate thesis in 1998. Dr. Quilty's work is also published extensively in a range of medical journals of Australia, and two of which are very relevant, I think, possibly three actually, to the work that we do here at NT Shelter and what we're trying to achieve in the Territory, most notably factors contributing to frequent attendance to the emergency department of a remote Northern Territory hospital, and more recent research which looked at climate, housing, energy, and Indigenous health and a call to action. Dr. Quilty has also issued a publication in uh, the Medical Journal of Australia in 2018, Crusted Scabies in the Catherine Region, Time for Disease Eradication. Uh, Dr. Quilty, Dr. Simon Quilty, welcome to the program, Simon. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. So I just want to start with, uh, as I read out in that bio, you, you did a undergraduate degree in engineering at Sydney University. And uh, then you went to start up, uh, you worked with a biotech startup and then decided to go back into medicine. Could you talk us through, I guess, what attracted you to engineering at the time and, and then your subsequent moves into medicine and public health? Well, it's, there's nothing uh, enthralling about the engineering choice. So I guess as a young kid, I spent a lot of time in remote NT. Uh, first time in the Catherine River when I was four years of age and one day I hoped to be buried 
on its banks. It's, it's the most beautiful town in Australia, I reckon. Uh, and so I was the first generation to go to university and I had no idea what to do. And I, the truth is I just wanted to make my car go faster, to be honest. So I thought mechanical engineering would get me there and uh, uh, finished that degree off and realised that I had a real calling to return to the Northern Territory and um, was working for a biotech company at that stage with a couple of doctors and as a 23-year-old man, had the bright idea that maybe um, I'd be useful if I did a medical degree. And when you're studying medicine and, and engineering, for that matter, does anything really prepare you uh, for what you're coming into when you come to the Territory as a physician, as a doctor? Um, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary place. It's so vibrant and beautiful and unexpected, and it's... Um, it's like a parallel universe, isn't it, really, for those of us that know what the Territory is like. And it was deeply enthralling. And, and what I thought that I'd do is bring knowledge here and um, contribute in, in that way. But what I feel like I've done after 20 years of being in the Territory is uh, have an incredibly rich and rewarding experience with uh, First Nations people who are incredibly generous and uh, remarkably knowledgeable about uh about their their country and um yeah so it's you, you can't be prepared for the northern territory unless you've spent time here i don't think and did you do you think you had a realistic uh sense of what you're coming into do you think it was maybe more demanding or challenging than, than you might have thought or, or did you know that you're coming into a very difficult environment from a medical perspective I guess what I didn't realise is how broken the political and bureaucratic and government institutions were up here. I presumed that there would be an appetite for improvement. Uh, I didn't see how, how dysfunctional the status quo is up here and I, I didn't recognise how difficult it was to achieve um, uh, uh, progress when progress is easily achievable. Uh, and to me, I, I think it took me 10 or 15 years to get my head around why it was so complex and challenging. Have you seen much change in that time? I don't think things are getting any better. Um, and I guess uh, my understanding of uh, remote Indigenous Australia that I, that I know quite well and, and uh, deeply admire uh, I don't think from a Western point of view and from a government institutional point of view, uh, nearly enough has been done. And I, I, I think that there's, there's um, I think things might be getting worse. That's very concerning to hear. And I, and I know in, um, in uh, some recent work that you've had published, you make a call out to, to GPs and to doctors in terms of the things they should be thinking about when they're, when they've got their, I guess, their patients in with them. So I guess I'm curious, what, as a starting point, why should doctors, I guess, especially here in the Northern Territory, take an interest in the housing circumstances of their patients? Well, I mean, I think this is one of the problems of expectations and understanding of the Territory, right? You come up here and you just presume that your patients have the same means as they did down on the East Coast. To put things in perspective, um, I'm doing some more research at the moment on heat and mortality, and uh, it was recently drawn to my attention that uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics records 253 suburbs in the Northern Territory, uh, and 73 of those are in the bottom 1%, and every single one of them is a remote Indigenous community, and there's only 75 remote Indigenous communities. You compare that to New South Wales, where there is uh, 3,500 suburbs suburbs, and yet there's only three of those that are in the, the bottom 1%. Uh, the extent and degree of poverty in Indigenous Australia and the Northern Territory is extreme, and it feels like a lot of people have either been acclimatised to think that that's normal or don't recognise it. And so often as a doctor, you're treating people with very complex medical problems, all too often diseases that are wholly present, uh, preventable by uh, providing healthy and appropriate housing, for instance, rheumatic heart disease and chronic kidney disease. Uh, and you're treating these people at really young ages, you're sending them home to houses where if you don't know these communities well, you don't realise that there might be 30 people living in a two-bedroom unit without a fridge. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of doctors in the Northern Territory uh, 
haven't been around long enough or perhaps haven't had the richness of experience to actually live uh, inside communities to understand how severe the poverty really is. And so, you know, you often make all of these assumptions when you send people home like they have a fridge or that their electricity never disconnects. We send somebody home with really bad emphysema and an oxygen concentrator that they rely upon to be alive, not knowing that the power disconnects every third or fourth day. Yes, and I guess there's other, for those who might not be so aware of the linkages between poor quality housing, insufficient housing and poorly maintained housing. And I guess I'd add to that poorly designed housing as well, which I know you've written some mm -hmm. things about. Um, those uh, those factors really do uh, contribute to poor health outcomes uh, and overcrowding, of course, with uh, kids and, and adults being in close proximity to each other with things like scabies and um, I guess gastrointestinal tract infections and a number of other things. Uh, is that what you see when you have patients yeah. coming through? Well, look, I guess not just patients, but also friends. I have a lot of friends that live in extreme overcrowding. Uh, I didn't realise what a, a two-bedroom house with 30 people living in it smelt like until one of my good mate's daughters uh, uh, invited my daughter for a, a party at their house. And um, it's unimaginable to have a tiny space with 30 people living permanently in it. And I guess you, you're right. The, so many of the disease processes that we see in the Northern Territory are a direct result of that overcrowding. So, for instance, with rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic heart disease is caused by being heavily colonised with streptococcus. Now, we all have a bit of streptococcus on our skin from time to time, and that's why we wash our hands. And if you live in an uncrowded house and you have a shower every day, then you have a very small burden. If you live in a house with 30 people on it and there's two, two or three couches, every time you sit down, you're sitting in somebody else's streptococcus footprint. And so you will gain the, the bacteria all over you. And within a few hours, you'll be hypercolonised, meaning that every square centimetre meter of your body is covered with streptococcus we have skin to prevent that streptococcus getting in and invading our body if you have a slight scratch and you're hypercolonized then your body will react to that uh, insult and uh, the immune system will attack that streptococcus and so for kids who are living in these environments getting scratches is just part of normal part of childhood but every time they get it they get a hyperimmune response because their immune system gets so good at recognizing this streptococcus uh, that it spills over and eventually attacks the heart uh, and the reason that that's really important and personal to me as well is that my, my grandfather died uh, 25 years before I was born of uh, rheumatic heart disease. Uh, he was 44 when he passed away. He grew up in post-depression uh, Sydney in, in a tiny little house in the inner city uh, in extreme poverty with nine siblings. And he and two of his other siblings got rheumatic heart disease. And what I find really interesting about that is that I know because I've worked and diagnosed, unfortunately, enough people with rheumatic heart disease to know that it is very familial, very, very strongly familial. Uh, and so when my grandfather passed away from rheumatic heart disease, what I see in Aboriginal communities is it's not just the grandfather, it's also the, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren that suffer from that. When my grandfather passed away, he was the last of... Of, of our family to have rheumatic heart disease. Mm. And I know what, what was different between my family and uh, my friend's families in towns like Catherine and Tennant Creek, and that is housing. Yeah. yeah. And it's all and about the hypercolonization of streptococcus, and you can't avoid it if you live in such an overcrowded house. Sure. And your colleagues, such as Dr. Bo Romini and Dr. Josh Francis and others, often refer mm -hmm. to acute rheumatic fever and mm -hmm. rheumatic heart disease as diseases of poverty. For the very thing that you're referring to, it seems to be a disease that we remember through grandparents or great grandparents that we have in, in when we had poverty more widespread in in uh, communities down south in Sydney and almost abolished now, uh, except for remote uh, Indigenous Australia. And um, Correct. yeah. Yeah, um, I, and I think that's an important um, area maybe we can explore because I know you've written about the normalisation of um, poverty, the normalisation of homelessness and, and Aboriginal housing, and I guess also the the um, aspects of colonisation and, and dispossession of Aboriginal land. 
Do you think we can truly close the gap on Aboriginal disadvantage until we, I guess, as a nation, unreservedly accept those those things? It is entirely achievable. It's just a matter of political will. And unfortunately, therein lies a problem within the Northern Territory and across Australia. The Indigenous people are only 3% of the population. And mainstream Australia, uh, really, when it comes down to the crunch, is not prepared to vote uh, to do the right thing. And it's an interesting uh, proposition because obviously the Australian public has stood out in very strong support of Indigenous people in, an, in a number of um, occasions in our history. And I'm really hoping that, that uh, we can progress to um, an Uluru Statement from the Heart, a, a, a treaty, which is what um, Indigenous people around Australia have been uh, uh, demanding for the last 50 years. Until we have some really solid ground upon which to understand each other, I don't think Indigenous people have enough voice uh, to have the political clout to do what's needed. But this is simply a problem of housing. We've sorted it out across Australia, except for remote and, um, and urban places in the Northern Territory, where it is so far from being sorted out. And I would argue, from my experience in the last 20 years, that it's getting worse. Yes, and that's... Um... That's a, a, a point I'd really like to come back to as we as we go through this interview because that's what we see um, as well. Um, I'd like to just um, touch on the work that you did at Catherine Hospital. Um, you've, you've noted that hospitals, certainly in the Northern Territory, don't keep data or haven't been keeping data on, um, I guess, housing status of patients presenting, um, and you believe they should. And I'm, I'm curious about this um, research you did in 2016 around factors contributing to uh, frequent attendance to the emergency department of a remote Northern Territory hospital, namely Catherine Town Hospital. Um, could you talk us through why that research and what you found? Um... I don't think you can talk about any of these issues without really talking honestly and openly about racism. And yeah. Catherine Hospital, when I arrived there, had a very serious problem with racism. And it certainly is, it certainly is in my memory of that place, the most dominant challenge that I faced almost every day, that there were staff at the hospital that expressed violent ideology that was based in racism towards Aboriginal people. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. There was once a, a, a non-Indigenous person that was admitted to the hospital and they didn't have a home and they had a bit of a social crisis and they were going to leave hospital and become homeless. And the staff at the hospital found this unfathomable and people raised money and... Uh, this person was ended up being discharged with an extraordinary amount of extra support because people couldn't imagine somebody being discharged to homelessness mm. in the middle of the build-up. And yet every single day we were discharging people from Catherine Hospital who were Indigenous to homelessness mm. and nobody seemed to care. Mm. Um, and... I think there's just a culture of acclimatisation where people just think, oh, that's how those black fellas live. But it's simply not true. It's not a choice. People are really pushed up against the wall with their, with their finances. Often these people have very limited literacy, Western literacy or uh, financial literacy. Uh, they're incredibly vulnerable. There's some really inappropriate um, business practices that seem to dip right into Aboriginal people's pockets uh, for their own benefit. Um, and so what I was seeing in Catherine Hospital, particularly for the most vulnerable, was I'd got to know the frequent attenders really, really well because they were always admitted under my care. And every time they were admitted, I could see what it was that was driving them back into hospital. And it was costing an exorbitant amount of money because finally when their health condition got to a crisis point, you'd trigger an area medical retrieval, which was somewhere in the vicinity of $15,000 to send them up to Darwin. And the total cost of a trip to Darwin through the healthcare system might be anywhere up above fifty dollars or even $100,000. Um, and so it seemed 
that nobody was taking the economic rationalists approach, uh, which is, well, really, let's look at how, how we can... Um, how we can best use our resources. And definitely nobody was taking the humanitarian approach, which was how do we make sure that we live in a better society? And so that's where that study stemmed from. I knew that there were ways that we could do things better. Uh, and so we ended up getting, I wanted firstly to document the severity of, um, of the homelessness and then, um, and then move on to a program that actually addressed it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, and you found, I think that it was 16 times, you were 16 times more likely to, to present to the emergency department if you were homeless um, than if you weren't. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was, uh, and by the way, that's, that's very powerful messaging and research and I guess advocacy that, that we use uh, and that we've been using actually in terms of the need to have short stay visitor accommodation in Catherine and I'm happy to say that finally we've got advice that there'll be a scoping study now done into delivering culturally appropriate short stay visitor accommodation for the people of the Big Rivers region. It's just really quite remarkable I think that you could have people coming to from all across the Big Rivers region to Catherine for medical treatment and there's no place to stay. And so bloody, bloody outrageous. I mean, I, don't even start me. It's infuriating, really, yeah. uh, that it's 2022 and here we are. And Peter, just in reflection of that, I remember back in, uh, I think it was 2017, when there was a, a substantial investment in the RAF Air Base, a $5 billion upgrade. And all of a sudden, there was a realisation that there wasn't enough accommodation for tradies in town. And so within three months, they had um, erected a an accommodation unit that I think um, housed somewhere between three or 400 people per night. Mm. And they did it in three months. When they need a tradie, they will move heaven and earth. When it's a First Nations person, nothing. It was disgraceful. And generations of territory politicians and federal po politicians really need to be held accountable for what has not been done in this space. Yeah, yeah. there's certainly some... Um... There's some hard truths, aren't there, that we have to come to terms with um, if we're ever to, um, I guess, um, do what's needed at scale to, to address these problems. And I'm, that's a good area to go into the next uh, question, which is that um, by its own acknowledgement, the Northern Territory Government estimates around 10 to 12,000 houses that they're short now in terms of social and affordable housing over the next couple of years. So that's a, a significant number. And that to build that amount of houses uh, would cost somewhere between six and ten billion dollars people obviously as you would well know will say look that's we don't, can't afford that's too much money it's not going to happen we tend to accept that we see a handful of houses put up here and there and that's that's applauded and every house makes a difference to a family there's no doubt about that but we're talking about an order of magnitude that's a lot higher than just 10 or 20 or 30 houses from time to time one of the things that we think makes sense and you used the economic rationalist um, phrase before we think that if there was an investment of uh, say 10 10 million dollars if that's what it costs to get this done once and for all to have the housing that we need that there would be uh, presumably um, benefits by doing that through avoided costs in the hospital system in the health system that offset a lot of that build cost because building houses is expensive no doubt about that but it seems to me it's short-sighted if we just defer those decisions to future years i mean we're gonna have to and i guess also oh, leads in to the energy um the the climate issue too doesn't it if we don't t do action now take action now the costs will be even greater absolutely i mean it's so true isn't it i mean eventually if the gap is to be closed, somebody needs to be the adult in the room and do what's needed. And it is all about housing in the Northern Territory. Every single problem with the gap in Indigenous social health welfare uh, is to do with housing, every single one of them. And until that $10 billion investment is made, we will continue to scratch our navel and wonder why. We don't need to wonder why. We don't need any more research. What we need is action. Uh, and until the $10 billion is spent, then we will be spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year on um, acute healthcare 
for young kids who have been diagnosed with rheumatic heart disease. And for me, that's really personal. I have told countless families that their son or daughter who is 10 or 15 has a new diagnosis of rheumatic heart disease. And the statistics are the same. 40% of people who are diagnosed with acute rheumatic fever will be dead before they reach 40 years of age. And until the $10 billion is spent, this will continue to flow along. Yeah. No, that's a shocking statistic. There's no doubt, no other way to put that. Uh, now, Simon, you've written, you made a, um, a submission to the Inquiry into Homelessness in Australia, which, um, which sets out in very clear terms some of these things we've already talked about. But it talks about, uh, you mentioned also um, a, a paradigm shift or a complete paradigm shift is needed through architectural design, community engagement and development when it comes to um, more housing stock. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, look, um, what strikes me about a lot of the houses that are currently be, being built uh, is that firstly, they're appalling quality. They're, they're often Besser brick, uh, core filled, which has terrible thermal properties. Uh, they often have no eaves on western facing walls. Uh, they have no thought put into them. And then when you walk into those houses, they're three bedroom, sure, they're bulletproof. Uh, indestructible, which they have to be if there's 30 people living in them. Um, but they are very poorly designed for pro-social pride in housing, happiness, thriving in your environment. And the average remote house, three-bedroom house at the moment is costing the Northern Territory Government around about $900,000 per house. Um, the Northern Territory Government has an awful lot to answer for for an incredible lack of accountability in how that money is spent i know for a fact because i have built a house in the northern territory and i've watched others build really beautiful houses for half that cost for houses that are really valuable to western people and so what i've discovered with indigenous people is that with, with some of my friends particularly in tenant creek is that they, the scar of colonisation is that many of these uh, people have no sense that they should have any agency in the way that their house looks. They believe that they, they get what they're given and they'll make the most of it, but they never imagine that they might be able to put a door here or make a window larger there yep. or put a veranda around the house or particularly have an outdoor kitchen. So when when Indigenous friends of mine came to my house in Catherine or Alice Springs where I had outdoor kitchens just because it's a beautiful way to cook, um, they were amazed. And when I said, well, why don't you have one? And they, they look perplexed that I would even suggest that they might be able to have a say in the way that they live in Western built infrastructure. And so engaging with First Nations people, they know how to live in very hot climates. There's plenty of beautiful creative space to work with First Nations people to build better houses for cheaper and to build houses, let's be honest, until we've dealt with this housing crisis, to build a house for 20 people. The houses that they're currently building in remote communities are built for six people at most, and yet there's 30 people occupying them as soon as the doors open. And, and they will simply not last, and there's no need to continue building these structures as if they're Alcatraz. They look like and function like Alcatraz. They're terrible design, and we need to hold the Northern Territory Government accountable for the way that they're spending our taxpayers' money on terribly designed houses. Another aspect as well that I find interesting is the notion that Aboriginal people will often say that their fathers or uncles mm. or brothers used to build houses in remote mm. communities and used to fix things uh, as they were broken before. And that seems to have come to a bit of a grinding halt it's probably since intervention and other, and other things that happened previously. Um, but the work that Health Habitat and the work of the late Paul Faleros and others have, have written around the living the nine healthy living practices um, have you have you got a view on that in terms of the importance and I guess the opportunity for Aboriginal people in communities themselves to be fixing things like taps or um, you know other other things that can enable the family to live a healthy life? I feel that 
<clears throat> I call it the politics of the vulnerable. I feel that the Northern Territory is a state that's built upon the provision of highly costly welfare to Indigenous people. And it's highly costly because it makes a lot of money for a lot of people who are all non-Indigenous. Uh, I've seen single taps being replaced in places like Lajamanu and costing $5,000. Uh, and so I, I feel like we live in a state where the status quo is that uh, Aboriginal people can't help themselves. We need to do it for them, but it's really hard work. And so we will charge through the nose. And absolutely, First Nations people are incredibly uh, innovative and resilient with what they have when given the opportunity. And I just see government after government failing to enter this space in productive ways. And that feeds a narrative that yeah. gets them re-elected. You've also talked about um, opportunities for reframing the way homeless services are delivered, uh, including, you know, handing some of the control back to, I guess, uh, programs that have worked that have already been successful, um, but maybe fall short a little bit of the traditional governance uh, expectations that Western culture has on the way that, uh, I guess, Aboriginal people undertake services that might be effective in a culture appropriate way for them. To, it might, uh, I think it's also um, consistent with what you said around funding. It might not surprise you, but the Northern Territory receives $20 million a year under the Fed government's national homelessness agreement uh, compared to states like Western Australia. They have $176 uh, million a year for less than half the number of homeless people that we have. And um, on a per person base, per homeless person, uh, estimated homeless, we receive uh, $1,400 a year and every other state and territory is receiving well over $10,000 per year. Why would we have been crazy enough to agree to a funding deal that gives funding for homelessness when we have 11% of Australia's homelessness population and we receive 1% of the funding. We're really shortchanging ourselves out of at least $170 million a year out of Canberra. What's, how do we, what do you make the, of that? I make of that that the political narrative is that uh, Aboriginal people are to blame and, you know, let's, let's leave the problem alone because it can't be fixed. It's all too complex. There's no, there's no uh, political capital in resolving the problems of Indigenous Australia because that's how Northern Territory defines itself. We're here to help Aboriginal people. Well, the state has clearly failed and it's clearly failed for at least two or three decades, if not longer. Um, and so I, I do believe we need a paradigm shift if we're going to resolve it. So, yes, I, I really believe... I have a deep sense of optimism, firstly, coming from the people that I know in how resilient they are uh, and how um, measured they are in the face of an uncertain future. Uh, but I also know that things can be drastically changed. And I feel like the Northern Territory is in a stasis that's not really purposeful. I don't think that the, the shortfall of the $170 million is something that's purposeful. I feel like it's just an acceptance and a, yeah. a, 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 a kind of um, a lass a lassitude or a, a, a lethargy in trying to help because let's face it, it is really hard. We live in a really challenging state. Mm. And to be, to be fair to the institutions in the Northern Territory, uh, for instance, Northern Territory Health, which I work for, uh, it has an incredibly challenging jurisdiction. Uh, it has terrible health outcomes dispersed across really remote tropical landscapes through wet season and dry. Um, it has, we have over 65 languages spoken within our jurisdiction. Uh, we have really challenging cultural paradigms of wellness that um, a third of our population expect and which we're not that good at delivering. Um, a really challenging space to start. Yeah. But the advantage that we have is that we're smaller and, you know, we're only talking about 10,000 homes. And, for instance, the the win that uh, Norm Frank Jabarula and I recently had when we got solar panels installed on his roof, the first 
remote Indigenous house to have that done, that cost 10,000 bucks. Not a single cent came from uh, Northern Territory government or the federal government in any form of subsidy. And uh, uh, Norm's family are now completely secure in their energy supply. They have not switched off their power since they've had those panels on the roof. And that, when you're talking about a cost benefit analysis from an economic rationalist point of view, uh, clearly has got very significant health benefits that wouldn't take much to pay for itself. And so there are really simple measures that, that, uh, that could be executed, uh, for, for instance, around energy security. The housing problem is more challenging, but I really do believe that it's disruptable and that we can actually build better houses for much less of the cost and, and really engage Indigenous communities, not only in the design, but also the construction and then the ongoing maintenance. If we if we could say with um, through research that it was clear that to spend, say, we used the figure of 10 billion before, if we could show that a $10 billion investment would result in $15 billion of savings over, say, um, 15, 20 years, whatever the case might be, do you think government would then get on and build the housing or do you think there'd still be a reluctance to say, well, you know, money could be spent on other things and, um, you know, going back to those acclimatisation and normalisation arguments, do you think that there is a real, there would be a desire um, to fix this if it could be shown that the benefits outweigh the costs? Well, I think there needs to be political will to achieve that um, and certainly a large-scale expenditure uh, would do it, but I don't think we have the corporate or or, or manpower infrastructure in the Northern Territory to do it quickly. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, whether they would do it if they knew that there was a return on investment that, that made it meaningful and acceptable, I still think that the Territory thinks of itself as a failure. Uh, a, a deep insecurity that we actually can't fix these problems. And I reckon that people would balk at it because there's people, because I, I think there's a, a fear of failure in this space. I think lots of people have genuinely tried really hard in the Northern Territory to close gaps and to do the right thing. Um, and over 50 years, effort after effort has not been re rewarded with what uh, uh, non-Indigenous people think it should be rewarded with. And so there's this lethargy in imagination, creativity, optimism and ambition mm. that seems to define the Northern Territory. I mean, you only need to go to a to a tourist destination and see how grumpy the, the bloke behind the bar treats you compared to other states to realise that the Territory has a specific kind of chip on its shoulder. Mm. Um, I think we need a state that's more ambitious, that really decides to take it on. And I don't know that you'd necessarily ever get an, an economic rationalist um, argument to say that building houses will eventually save money. I think building houses will just at least put Indigenous people on par with non-Indigenous people. Sure. You know, time to pay the rent, right? We have lived off the fat of this land. We live in a highly wealthy country and the people that are left behind are the people who have lost all of their land. Yeah. This isn't an insurmountable cost for Australia or the Northern Territory. Yeah, no, that's well said. I, I guess I'd like just to turn to the work you've done recently on climate, housing and energy. And you've um, referred there to, I guess, what are essentially those hot boxes? Uh, you talked before about those Bessa block and... Um, the heat, the people may not be aware, but those who those people who live in uh, public housing in the tropical end of the territory are only entitled to a ceiling fan. And um, down in the arid zone, it's I think it's evaporative uh, air conditioning system cooling. So um, it's not exactly uh, a lot of comfort, is it, living in a hot house in an overcrowded house with rising temperatures? And you've reported in that study some pretty concerning increase in heating, Catherine. Oh, not just Catherine uh, Darwin as well. So I don't know if you've seen the most recent uh, report on climate change that uh, the Northern Territory Government has commissioned, uh, but it, it suggests that... Uh, so in, in 2004, when I got to Darwin, there were on average 11 days a year above 35 degrees Celsius in Darwin, those really hot, sweaty days. Uh, I think last year was about 40 days. They predict by 2030 that it will be around about 100 days. Uh, or even more, and by 
I think by 2070, they're talking about 250 days a year. Gone is the dry season. We are going to live in extraordinarily hot times in the Northern Territory. Um, and even in the last few years, I've... I haven't driven the question, but I've had patients, particularly from places like Tennant Creek, say to me that they can't continue to live in their house anymore because it's too hot when the power switches off and they can't afford electricity. And can they can that they please get my assistance in letters that I write to try and help them resolve their housing crisis? I think people are already experiencing a climate change crisis in remote housing. When you get a stretch of of, for instance, in, in Catherine, I think we had 17 days in a row above 40 degrees Celsius in 2019. The previous record was six days in a row, set seven or eight years before. Uh, and on average, uh, the long-term average, there's only six days above 40 degrees Celsius in Catherine for the whole year. So having 17 days above 40 degrees Celsius doesn't also point to you that during that period, we also had two temperatures that were unsurpassed. The first one happened on about day six, and the second one happened on the 25th of December, 2019, when it reached the hottest temperature it's ever been in Catherine. I think it got up to 45 degrees Celsius from memory unbelievably hot when the humidity is so high it's pretty dire stuff you've and you've called for for an action plan around that um because there is an urgency about it. it's not something yeah. we can simply afford to say we'll come back to that in a few years time this is, hap this is happening now isn't it and people as you point out who have um complex underlying medical conditions are particularly vulnerable in heat yeah, oh, look, there comes a point where in anyone that can't shelter from temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius will eventually die if the evening temperature doesn't um, allow them some respite. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess what we are now looking at in the Northern Territory is these threshold temperatures. So your body might be able to handle 40 degrees Celsius for eight hours. It might be able to handle 44 degrees Celsius for two hours, it might be able to handle 48 degrees Celsius for half an hour, and it might be able to handle 50, 52 degrees Celsius for, for 10 minutes. Mm. Uh, we're coming close to that tipping point where people, regardless of age, regardless of comorbidities, will be in environments that if they can't escape it, they will die. And... Of course, people with comorbidities will die at much lower temperatures. Those thresholds will be lower. We're, we're absolutely in that space right now. I just want to uh, read back something that I picked up off, off your LinkedIn profile, which I unashamedly was stalking before we've talked. Um, you've referred to that role as medical director of Purple House. You said it's the best job I've ever had and has proven to me that the impossible is indeed possible with commitment, disruption and authentic community leadership. So I've had the pleasure of, I guess, seeing some of the work at Purple House that Sarah and her team do there. I think it's incredible what and uh, important what they do. Why do you describe that as the best job you've, you've ever had? What is it about that role and, and Purple House that's been so rewarding? Well, firstly, it's an unknown organisation. My bosses are to be people. And um, I know that there is wisdom. And I think a lot of Australians see that as a little bit of lip service, but I have had the privilege of working for, for uh, First Nation elders for the last 20 years. And I understand their, the depth of their knowledge structures and the, the, the richness of their culture and their understanding of their landscape and of society. Um, and so having Pindaby bosses is, is really exciting. Uh, their ambitions don't align at all with Western ambitions, and yet um, the organisation, through some fantastic Indigenous and non-Indigenous shared leadership, uh, shows that anything is possible. And so the idea of going carbon neutral by 2025 was something that I suggested, and it, the organisation just said, of course, I mean, you're right, let's do it. And then I didn't do much work. The organisation just responded. Responded. We need to learn how to be more responsive and to dream really big. And we need to absolutely value our First Nations communities and elders with the, 
deepest respect that they deserve. We have to treasure them as national icons, as the leaders of, of past many generations of humanity in Australia and, and ongoing leaders in the way that Australia shapes itself. And I really feel that Purple House uh, works, works within that space in a truly extraordinary way. And uh, my final question, I guess, is an extension of that. And um, uh, you've already, uh, you've come back, you said at the start of this discussion that you felt you had a sense of obligation to come back to the Northern Territory um, and to make a contribution, which you've done over, over many years now. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm assuming it's been quite some years before you hang up your boots, but what would be, what would you like to see as your legacy um, at the, by the time when you do get to that stage of what's been achieved in the Northern Territory? I guess also um, having, having, having regard to the fact that you said, in your words, the impossible is indeed possible. Uh, I, I, I won't really, I don't, like all people, none of us will really leave a legacy. Uh, I'd like to be able to speak Walpri fluently. Um, uh, 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 but I guess um, I know I love the Northern Territory and I have a short sojourn out of the Territory, but I will be back and I will uh, finish my life in the Territory eventually. Um, it is home. It is, I'm part of the fabric. I'm part of the interconnectedness, the amazing wovenness of the Northern Territory, which you, you become part of, which is... Uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, there's some extraordinary people in the Territory, uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. It's a wonderful place to live and work. Um, and I'm just really glad that my life, um, uh, in my life, I've made choices that have um, given me that beautiful opportunity um, to work in places like Catherine with First Nations elders and, and learn a bit of language. Yeah, it's plenty for me. I'd love to see improvement of housing. Well, I think it's pretty safe to say uh, we'd be certainly very happy to subscribe to all of that. And, and we've been happy to have you, uh, Simon, uh, doing the work that you've done. We didn't talk about Alice Springs Hospital, but I know you made a, a big contribution there as well and a number of other different areas as well. But I'd like to thank you for your time today. It's been a really, um, I think, a really enlightening conversation. And we've covered some really key key areas around what needs to be done and, and what can be done if there's the will. So I'd like to thank you for your time. And so much uh, for you, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Simon. You've been listening to Dr. Simon Quilty on this episode of Sharing the Couch. Uh, as we said at the start of the episode, please uh, tune in uh, on our YouTube channel uh, at NT Shoulder. And uh, to make sure you don't miss out on any other uh, podcasts that we have coming up or those that we've already recorded. And thank you for your time. Have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm.